Hey, thanks, Marissa. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Viet. I lead our customers talent advisory team here at GEM. Um, I get to work with talent leaders like Chauncey, Hill, you'll meet in a second. And my role is to be a thought partner for them and work on strategic, strategic initiatives on behalf of GEM. And prior to my role here, um, I mainly led recruiting teams um, at various startups. You know, most recently I was leading the team at One Medical, um, but I'm really enjoying my new role now because I get to do stuff like this. And uh, today we're gonna be talking about all the benefits and challenges um, of uh, remote hiring. Um, Chauncey, do you wanna share a bit about yourself? Yeah, thank yeah. you. I'm so excited to be here with you yet and um, great to be here with, with everyone in the audience. Um, so a bit about myself, uh, I've spent the last four years or so working in various roles within Slack's recruiting team. Um, most recently in the last year, I've been building out a centralized sourcing organization. So prior to that, I was leading all R&D recruiting for the company and before Slack, I um, come, come from startup land, right? I was, I was a talent leader at a number of smaller growth stage companies, all really in the tech and biotech space. So great to be here. Nice. And, um, you know, Chauncey and I have had many conversations leading up to this one and um, trying to figure out exactly what we talk about, what would be helpful for other talent leaders. And, you know, something that was very apparent was most people don't really know what they're doing right now as far as like moving to the remote first hiring world. Uh, it's completely uncharted territory for most of us. And, um, you know, today I think we're going to discuss, you know, some of the advantages, disadvantages of this new world and, and hopefully everyone can take something away and, and bring it back to uh, their normal jobs. So, you know, Slack is particularly interesting because it's a centerpiece for working remotely and, you know, we'd love to hear, you know, what's like, what's been like for you so far, but maybe before we jump in, uh, maybe some context around like Slack's philosophy on, uh, remote work uh, prior to COVID and what does it look like today? Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I'm excited about this topic because we, we could like nerd out on anything about recruiting. So this is great. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, so uh, as far as Slack goes, and I mean, ironically, Slack was designed to empower teams regardless of location, right? Like our, our CTO, when he first joined the company, lived in England and the rest of the team was, was on the West Coast here. But um, frankly, we weren't really all that friendly of a remote environment um, prior to COVID. Uh, the philosophy really of the founders um, was was really kind of along the lines of Steve Jobs ethos of, you know, magic happening in between meetings and in between work, um, work periods. Um, and so we were actually a pretty meeting heavy culture. That said, um, prior to Slack, we were already into, already starting to, to explore some conversations about being more decentralized. We had opened up a bunch of you know remote offices and that sort of thing. But um, you know, COVID very much accelerated uh, all of those discussions. And um, you know, I mean, I think we all kind of remember last March. But one Thursday, we all got an email saying, actually, it was a post: <laughs> "Don't come into the office, um, and we'll let you know when you can." Um, and we've been remote ever since. Uh, and the, uh, the interesting thing though, I think is that we've really embraced the change. I, I think the first week it was sort of like, you know, business as usual, trying to figure out what's going on. But, um, by the end of March and early April leadership and, and the rest of the company, I think following suit really had, had, um, embraced the change as a big opportunity to rethink kind of how we all work together. So. Um, I remember Stuart was consistently saying, we have an opportunity during this window to blow up all the old ways we work together, right? So if you have a one hour meeting with a team, could it be a 15 minute meeting, right? Could it be a five minute meeting, right? So really kind of thinking about how we can sharpen the purpose of everything that we're doing and um, essentially make better decisions out of that. And I, I think that one of the things I've, I've seen in the last couple of months has been much, um, like I said, much more sharpened decision making, but also shortened cycles in terms of how long we spend thinking about decisions and, and evaluating them. Yeah, I I still remember that week when uh, Slack came out and said, you know, don't come into the office because we were very much in the same boat. And mm -hmm. you know, Jen, very similar to Slack, we very much have taken in stride. Mm -hmm. um, you know, getting tighter how we spend time and energy is so incredibly important these days. Um, but frankly, I'm actually pretty surprised to hear that Slack was less remote friendly, um, just given the product and such. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the idea behind Slack is about um, removing uh, transactional interactions, right? So whether you're talking about like interfacing with software or 
meetings where you're really just doing some sort of transactional update or something. Um, and, and really the focus on the product was for us to provide more space for actual authentic face-to-face -face kind of connection and work. And, um, you know, we've very much had a focus at Slack on useful meetings and serendipitous interactions. So I think the thing that, that it really, we really focus on is cutting out status meetings. Um, you know, essentially, if you're going to be in a meeting, the thing that we're always saying to our people there is, you know, you should be either making a decision, building a connection or steering something. And you shouldn't just be going to be informed or to inform. That's something you could do in channel, right? Or, or in a DM. Um, I think like this is actually one of the things I'm, I'm to, to shamelessly plug Gem that I'm really excited about um, is that y'all are actually coming out with that uh, that that Slack integration that's going to automatically push pipeline updates to hiring managers and teams and that sort of thing. And that's one of those things where I think it's great because it frees up the recruiter from having to go like fump around and find the numbers for the week and actually tell the story around those numbers, which is actually the, the much more useful use of their time. Yeah, I um, I still remember at my last team we had stand up every day, every recruiter bring like their laptop and they pull up um, our ATS greenhouse and they would go through each candidate and be like, oh this right. can't right. offer this can't this and it was like frankly just not a very good use of time and yeah and, <laughs> it's super boring <laughs> it really is like no one like the only person paying attention is the person running stand up and the person speaking mm -hmm. everyone else is zoning out. <laughs> and so like these Slack notifications and or the Slack notifications we've just come out with, I think will hopefully save a lot of people time. But I mean, you know, going back to kind of what we were talking about around kind of the interactions between people like during this time, you know, I feel like my interactions with my immediate team still feel pretty good. Like we because we know each other and like we haven't that personal connection will always be there, whether it's remote or in person it's been a lot harder with, you know, with hiring partners or kind of with um, cross-functional partners. Um, I've had a much harder time just like building and strengthening those relationships. I'm curious like how that's been for you and your team given how important it is in recruiting. Yeah, it's, it's tough. I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie and say like, we've got a silver bullet, but I, I do think the thing that I've learned in the last couple of months is you really have to make space specifically for building relationships. And um, and nowadays that means dedicated meetings. And in some ways, Zoom makes that easier because you can literally transition from one meeting to another by clicking a button. But it also makes it a lot harder because everyone's freaking tired, right? And they're tired of Zoom. And and um, but so you you need to basically remember that you have to stay relevant to them and understand what they care about. And I think giving time back to people too quickly is frankly the first step to becoming irrelevant. Right. It's a slippery slope because they're like, I got work I got to do and that sort of thing. But but that is your work as a leader. Um, and so I think it's really important to, to remember you, you have to know who you need to keep a main, and maintain a relationship with. And I think COVID has made that clear in that essentially you've got partners that rely on you for stuff and then partners that you rely on to get stuff done and understanding, you know, how often do you have to maintain a, re a relationship with them? And more importantly, what do all those people care about is, I think, the most uh, important thing, right? Because as long as you've got a pulse on that and you're checking in on it, you know, you can, you can manage everything else remotely a lot, a lot easier. Um, and I, so I think like my advice is fight that urge to give or get 30 minutes back when there isn't like an immediate agenda or pressing items, you know, um, instead try and use that as time to, to gain credit in the social bank account with that person. Right. And, and I think this is, this is tough, right? Cause I'm a, I, I'm a very direct, like business-like person, and I get to know you by working with you and collaborating with you. Um, so small talk is <laughs> kind of <laughs> tough for me, right? But um, I have to remind myself to take that time and get to know people and and um, and and find opportunities to build relationships that way. Yeah, I mean, it's like I feel like it's so easy to be like, "Hey, do you have any pressing? Do you have an agenda for the meeting?" Mm -hmm. The answer is no. It's like, great. Let me just give you some time back. It's right. like. <laughs> you're pretending to be gracious but really like i think it's like i would love 30 minutes back right or i would love not to try to like force some conversation it just happens yeah. and um yeah. but i think some of the uh some of the you know meetings where there's no agenda feels like i have some of the most interesting conversations i remember you actually telling me about one of those yeah. like with your yeah. head of sales right 
Yeah, so we we recently um, got a new head of sales recruiting at Slack, um, who's fantastic. Uh, and uh, she had just joined, I guess it was like in the spring. And I was going into like my second or third one-on-one -on -one with her. And um, it was like third or fourth. And, you know, the, the thing was, we weren't doing a ton of sourcing for her team at that time. So I didn't have a, a lot of top of mind things I had to talk to her about. I didn't have a lot of pressing agenda items. Um, and I was really like, I was thinking, oh, I should just give her that time back, right? Um, but I was really glad I didn't because when I made space in that meeting just to approach it and say like, hey, you know, what's top of mind for you? What's on your mind? What's, what are you worried about? Um, just generally outside of sourcing or recruiting or, or anything like that, we were able to have a really interesting conversation where we kind of riffed on what was, what were her priorities, right? And what was she worried about? And that was great because it opened up opportunities for me to find places where I or my team could be invaluable to her. Um, and so um, I, a lot of the way I kind of approach that is, you know, starting with simple questions around like, what's top of mind for you? What are you worried about? What are your goals? What are your OKRs, right? But um, in terms of, of her in particular, we found that there was a great opportunity for sourcing to help represent the recruiting funnel, right? Because because sourcing essentially lives in the numbers and the top of funnel, you know, we have an awesome opportunity to um, help feed that information back to, to the recruiting teams and, and help them really understand where they're doing well and where there are opportunities. And so that was an awesome um, place where I was able to pinpoint places where I, I and my team could be useful to her and help solve problems that she was wrestling with that and frankly didn't see a solution to right in front of her face. So. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, we talk a lot about recruiting data and, um, you know, especially in, a, in the remote world where, you know, it's it's hard to understand like how hard the recruiting team is working or how are the sourcing team is working from a hiring partner's perspective. Like when you're able to actually use numbers to then like back that up, it makes it a lot easier to have that conversation especially for sourcing. I mean, sourcing, yeah. uh, probably easier than any other part of the funnel. It's really easy to just talk about conversions, like yeah. X, X input is gonna give you Y output. Um, but I, I generally just really like the idea of being able to take, um, just really asking, you know, what are you thinking about? What are your priorities? And being able to add value, not just in the recruiting context, but as a business partner. Yeah. Um, I feel like in, again, in most of my one-on-ones, like it's, they don't have agendas. And, you know, even since you and I started talking about this, I've, I've kept a lot of them. And they, we often talk about like these somewhat seemingly very random things, but we all leave the conversation, you know, feeling pretty good about the interaction we just had because, you know, it effectively interacts with, or it, um, I guess, takes takes place of that water cooler conversation that you used to yeah. have I'm like, hey, let's go grab coffee. Um, yeah. But I mean, just kind of underscore, we all know how important like cross-functional partnerships are. And I think we need to take every opportunity to solidify those relationships, especially like when we're not crossing each other in the halls. Yeah, um, totally. You know, one of the, um, you know, Slack was one of the first companies to announce that like they would go remote first uh, mm -hmm. at the very beginning of shelter in place. Um, you know, how are your team, how's your team or Slack thinking about um, hiring outside of, you know, the coast, the San Francisco's and the New York's? Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, candidly, this is timely. We're, we're working through a lot of this right now. And again, I'd be lying if I told you we got it all figured out, but um, there is a ton of interest in uh, distributing hiring uh, in, in sort of non-traditional tech hubs um, right now at Slack. And and so I think, you know, the the, Thing that really comes to mind for me is we're finding a ton of value out of LinkedIn Talent Insights, um, to and we're using that really to kind of get a, a good grip on what does the talent market actually look like in these areas as we start to consider where we're going to be hiring. Um, so we we actually secured LTI back in June, and it, it almost immediately really transformed our our speed of calibration for actual ongoing searches, but also really the the level of data and intelligence that we could bring to the table with um, with hiring managers, right? Um, we were able to essentially use it for kind of two real real key things. One was really talent mapping. So again, like you know, going in on a search and saying, hey, what does the, the market look like for SAF engineers in X location, right? And then the other is really understanding sort of uh, for total addressable markets, right? Um, 
and um, and looking at at that to to sort of shorten that cycle on the beginning of the search. So our sourcers are are actually routinely bringing um, LinkedIn to to their kickoffs with hiring managers. They're opening up talent insights, and they're doing live drill downs at the end of a kickoff meeting once they've got some detail on you know the role and the job titles and location and that sort of thing. And they're doing that um, to help the manager calibrate and also start to inform the search early on. And I, I think the interesting thing about it is it it's really saving us a ton of time on that upfront piece of the search where you can spend three or four or five weeks sourcing and trying to find like the ideal candidate before you realize, oh, that ideal candidate looks a little different than we thought. And so we have to change our search slightly. And and that's saving us, you know, weeks and in some cases months of, of burnt cycles and, and um, you know, wasted candidates. So I think it's been really, really game changing for us. Yeah, I mean, it's being able to effectively find a shortcut to figure out like how to where their hotspots um, yeah. and where you should be spending time is, is super valuable. And, you know, I imagine one of the challenges with hiring a new territory is just the talent might look different. Um, yeah. So yeah. a story comes to mind, like, so one of my roommates, uh, kind of going back now six years ago, and still like one of my really good friends, um, he had moved from uh, Chicago uh, to come yeah. over for a book. And he had come from Orbitz. And I don't know about you, but I knew nothing about <laughs> Orbitz as a company other than like I booked flights from there sometimes. And as, as a recruiter looking at an engineer, I'm sizing him up. I'm like, okay. Like, <laughs> You know, is like, is he a good engineer? Is he a bad engineer? Like, kind of, what's his deal? I mean, that's it's just, an occupational like, hazard. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> what we do. And, yeah. um, but because I didn't know anything about orbits, I couldn't use like my normal biases um, to say, you know, whether he was, you know, a good engineer or a bad engineer, as opposed to, let's say, if I met somebody like a lead engineer from Slack, I was like, all right, this, guy, this person's pretty decent. Um, yeah. And so, because like, frankly, I'm just like not used to seeing people from orbits. And I think as we start to move into these new markets, like you're going to start seeing talent from these companies that you're not used to seeing. Like yeah. how do you recommend, you know, us adapting to, to this changing landscape? I mean, it's, that's, it's challenging, right? I mean, we don't have our standard signals that we can use um, when we go into these new markets and say, oh, this person's from Amazon or Google or Airbnb or something. And so by, by losing this crutch, it really, it really forces us to, to change um, and reevaluate how we think about our recruiting funnel and our process and, and actually really just rethink recruiting from first principles. Um, and so I think like the actually finding the talent in these markets isn't a difficult challenge. Like the, you know, good engineering talent, good sales talent, good leadership talent exists outside of San Francisco and New York. I think what's really uh, challenging is resetting the expectations of the hiring team um, who are in many cases really kind of used to using these these biases from hiring out of Silicon Valley companies and, and fan companies, right? Um, and so I think the crux of this, like I said, is really sort of coaching the hiring managers as well as the hiring team to be really honest and transparent about what they're looking for. Like, what are the actual needs in the role? And so, you know, that becomes a conversation about diverting them from hire me someone from X company or from Y team at Facebook, right? And change it to really rethinking about the, the need, not about profile, but about what is the upstream business problem that that manager is trying to solve, right? Because essentially like a recruiter is solving a business problem. They're not necessarily just looking for a profile and, and the recruiter can't be successful if they're not really deeply aware of what that business problem actually is right and so if you have a good lock on that then you can really focus on um on what the the team and the manager actually need and this also coincidentally is basically how you go about um diversifying your funnels too um so i mean the the qualifications and the skills really matter and being really clear about what is crucial to have and what isn't. And then being critical about kind of the why, right? Like if you are being told, hey, I need to hire someone from SaaS. Great, that's fantastic, but um, be really clear about why that is. And if that's because they don't have time to train someone on how to be an effective SaaS salesperson, then maybe that should be worked in, but maybe also that's a conversation for maybe that this role isn't a good one to go and try to, to hire from in Iowa or Nebraska. Maybe this is one that we actually need to hire for in San Francisco or New York. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And it's effectively, you know, 
when you say like, I need somebody who, um, you know, graduated from, I don't know, Stanford, Stanford's mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And what does that actually it's always mean? Stanford. <laughs> right? And like, basically just like boiling that down to like, kind of what does it actually mean? Maybe it might yeah. mean they have really strong algebraic skills. They might mean they're mm -hmm. entrepreneurial spirited. It can mean it's so many different things. And I think as a recruit, like us talking to like our teams, like, hey, uh, I need you to go have that tough conversation with hiring managers and asking them why, like, why do they need this yeah. thing? And if yeah. they get back into like a, like a business need, then we have to push back as a team because otherwise we're yeah. just setting ourselves up for failure. And, um, and I think there's, it's one thing to coach hiring managers, which is difficult, uh, but it's only one person. But then yeah. now you start to introduce this idea. Now you've to, now you have interviewers in the loop, and you have yeah. to coach them. Um, like, how do you even like begin to have some of these tough conversations? I mean, I think that's where we kind of loop back to our first first discussion about about building relationships, right? Like, you can't you can't go have these conversations if you've never built these relationships with your hiring partners, right? And and um, you you essentially you need to really have some social goodwill in the in the bank account with them as it were to draw down against to go say like hey what you're doing isn't isn't the right way to do this let me show you how you can be more effective you know that that requires some trust right and so you have to build that trust um but i think a lot of it comes down to understanding like what is driving them to your point right is it is it um fear or love i once worked with a uh, hr business partner who basically said that there's a theory out there that people essentially only feel either fear or love. And I think that's a possibly overly reductive, but I think it's an interesting framework to think about people in your business life because you can think about like, okay, are they optimizing for algorithmic skills in a Stanford CS degree because that's what they know and they've worked with good people from there. And so it's comforting, or is it that they're actually trying to hire someone for um, uh, you know, an ML role that has great algorithmic chops, right? Um, where there's still room for, for coaching there, right? But, um, you know, I think essentially educating the leaders about what is going to look like in these different geographies using LinkedIn for that is, is really helpful. And um, and really focusing on competency-based recruiting that all flows out of that that business need. Yeah, I think it's, um, when you talk to hiring managers, I think trying to break, again, break down what is it they want into very specific competencies that can effectively be evaluated. Um, right. And it's, I think going back to your like point really, really early on, it's like, this is an opportunity for us, for us to really blow up all of kind of how we've operated so far and hopefully do it better. Yeah. Um, you know, can you share a bit of an example of like, um, you know, how you need to evaluate uh, talent from different geos um, yeah. and maybe how you may have to look at things with a slightly different lens? Yeah. I mean, it definitely, like I said, it, it sort of starts with understanding the, the business need. But um, thinking about my own ex example here, um, I think the thing that comes to mind is is uh, hiring a recruiter in India for the first time um, for my team last year. Um, the, you know, it was a brand new area. Um, what, 14 hour time difference. I had never hired anyone in India. I knew nothing about India. I was woefully unprepared. I went like bought a bunch of books when we started it about just the history of India. But anyway, long story short is I knew that I needed to find someone who was an excellent recruiter, but who also was really good at communication and collaboration. And that for me was kind of the thing that that I was really trying to optimize for. That's what I loved and feared, right? Um, was, was trying to find someone who could be transparent with me about what was going on in the office, you know, 15 hours uh, and halfway around the world and um, someone who would collaborate really well with our team. Um, and so the thing that I, I really tried to do was, was hand off a lot of the nuts and bolts competencies to my team and say, look, you evaluate for closing skills, you evaluate on, on sourcing, and then I'm gonna focus on, can I collaborate and work with this person? And do other people feel the same way? Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, that was pretty key for me. I, I think um, it was, it was, uh, a really interesting search because it, it really challenged me to sort of let go of a lot that I'm usually used to like holding on to because I really only had like a half an hour to an hour of daylight overlay overlap with this person. So I had to be really focused about what I cared about and about the search we ran. So, so yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a, I was just talking to uh, someone else on our team is, you know, people tend to be, you know, spiky. I, I think is the word you've used yeah. previously, where right. it's like, they're really, really good at certain things and they may not be good as others. And depending on what the business need is, maybe that's okay. Maybe like yeah, they're right. really strong communicators and collaborators, but maybe like they're not as strong at closing. Like that yeah. might be okay because uh, you can support them on the closing end or whatever it may be. And so, exactly. yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Like we've, we've already gone 25 minutes. So I just want to like do a really quick summary uh, for kind of everything we covered today for the audience. So, um, so one, I think it's super important to maintain relationships with cross-functional partners as we move into remote hiring, uh, remote first hiring environment. Um, we need to take advantage basically of every, every one of those reoccurring meetings to build relationships at the very least. Um, and I think, and to effectively t build up that social credit, as you put it, um, yeah. so that when we need to have those hard conversations, we can, uh, two is, um, you know, I think was a, we always talk about competency based recruiting or evaluation, yeah. even prior to COVID, but now that we're starting to hire in new geos, like, like where our normal shorthands may not apply, like we need to break those like those things that we would take for granted really down into like their individual competencies and then actually build evaluation for those. And then also make sure those competencies back into business needs. Um, probably the third thing I caught on was like, it's, it's really important to like uh, pressure test, like all of the, what we previously were like requirements. Um, yeah. And then probably the last thing is like, I think I, I actually never use talent um, or LinkedIn talent insights, but it seems like a really good tool for people when they're starting to move into new geos or have the opportunity to, to start to understand like, you know, should we invest in Austin? Should we invest in Scottsdale? Mm -hmm. uh, but those are like probably the four things I, I like that really stuck out to me. Um, yeah. Is there anything else that I was missing you think? I think the, the only thing I'd add there is just like being really intentional about the meetings and interactions you have with people and kind of filing off all of the fluff, all of the stuff that's like, you know, like if you're meeting with someone for to build a relationship, meet, meet for 30 minutes, build a relationship. Um, don't tack it onto the end of like a status update meeting and that sort of thing. I think people are fatigued of, of video meetings. And so I think that's the the trick that I found that's been really helpful in sort of, but breaking up my day and also like managing all the demands that we have here. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, this, this has been great. I. You know, I'm curious, like, you know, you guys are now, or we're, I guess, I guess we're all been in this for seven, eight years. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, where are you at right now and, and hired beyond these major metros. Yeah. I mean, we're, uh, it's timely. We're, we're really in the thick of, of uh, fiscal year planning. Um, I, I will definitely, again, I'll, I'll just say like LinkedIn Talent Insight has been um, nothing short of, of game changing for us and really important as we, provide feedback both to our finance teams and as, and also like the the partner teams of, of engineering and product and, and sales and that sort of thing. Um, I will say like we personally, I am thrilled. Like I feel like we're on the verge of a gold rush of talent because there's so much great talent that hasn't really been tapped very deeply in all of these, these other areas outside of San Francisco and New York. And so I think this is really, very exciting and i'm excited about kind of seeing what the the future of the work landscape looks like um and and seeing just like a bit more of a democratization of, of opportunities there yeah yeah i am um, no thanks for sharing and uh, i think we're all just really just, it sounds like we're just all trying to figure it out and <laughs> right <laughs> um, well this is incredibly fun we're we're almost just the time i want to make sure we can get to like one or two of these questions sure um so like i think one of the questions that came in that, that caught my eye was you know, how do you think compensation philosophies will shift um, as hiring is democratized? You know, oh, into man. yeah. So, I mean, I'm not speaking for Slack here, and I'm not a compensation uh, guru, but I will be like, I'm really interested in seeing how um, compensation shifts for different roles in the coming months and years. You know, as as tech starts to pursue more talent outside of, of the traditional hubs, right? I, I think most companies prior to COVID have pursued compensation and talent in a very like location-based kind of way of like, you know, SF and New York pay this amount and Seattle is this amount and Toronto might be that amount, right? And um, I think my hypothesis is that 
you'll start to see compensation be much more role-based, right? So that engineer that you're hiring in, in Nebraska, and you're saying that they're just as good as the engineer that you would hire in New York, will probably at some point start to command the same salary, right? And maybe, I think the question is sort of how quickly does that gap close? But I also think conversely, the pressure may be um, ultimately to drive down some sal salaries in really much more expensive areas. I mean, um, that old New York engineer really can't command the same salary as they did if, if all the talent is in the middle of the market or middle of the country and, and demanding less, right? So I think the, the next level of this is, does <laughs> that continue to accelerate that flywheel of people leaving metro areas to lower cost areas? So um, I'm probably going way too far down the rabbit hole, but, um, but that, I mean, that's some of what's top of mind for me as I think about this. So this this is what we spend our time doing when we're not actually doing work work. We just like yeah. talk about these <laughs> um, that I think everyone's wondering about. But we're we're just at time. Uh, Chauncey, you're amazing. This is super fun. Uh, everyone, Thank thanks you. for joining me and Chauncey on this call to talk about remote hiring and you know, enjoy the rest of Gem Summit. Thank you so much. Good to see everyone. See ya.